just a few words about this next piece, which is also a piece that you probably have never heard before. And I think it's a beautiful piece, but an unusual piece with a kind of a peculiar backstory, which may have something to do with the fact that people don't play it that often. But I'm really delighted that he came to play it for us today. It was inspired by a, a female saxophonist. Her name is Elise Hall. And she was an amateur saxophonist. She didn't start playing the saxophone until she was 47 years old. <laughs> and her story is a little peculiar. In the late years of the 19th century, she was American. She married an American doctor. And uh, although she had been born in France, and they moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. And, and he was very well fixed. He had a lot of money. And when they got out to the West Coast, they moved to Santa Barbara. And 125 years ago, when they moved to Santa Barbara, it was a backwater. And after a while, she began to notice that her hearing was deteriorating, getting worse and worse. And so she said to her husband, what can I do about this? And he suggested that she take up a woodwind instrument. Uh, he thought that by blowing powerfully against the reed, maybe it would open the tubes in her ears or something like that. I, who knows? But she, she, she bought into the idea. And of course, it turned out that in Santa Barbara, there were no woodwind players 125 years ago. There was, in fact, a saxophone player. And so she signed up for sax lessons. And she progressed, but of course, she was not destined to become a great virtuoso. She liked the instrument. In 1897, her husband died, leaving her a lot of money. And so she moved back from the West Coast to the East Coast. They moved to, she moved to Boston, where she could continue studying the saxophone. And where, loving music, she became the main donor and the head of an amateur orchestra, which was called the Boston Orchestral Club. And it was her dream to play the saxophone in this club, in this orchestra. But at that time, the saxophone was barely 60 years old. There was not a lot of music that had been written to play in orchestras. And so she decided at that point in her life that her mission would be to commission music that would be involving the saxophone. It wouldn't be necessarily concertos because she really didn't have the chops to play concertos. I mean, she was not a virtuoso like, like Stephen. And she was extremely effective at this. She was well organized and she was tenacious. And she commissioned over 20 pieces of music uh, featuring the saxophone. And, and she was an important figure in saxophone history, apparently. Her dream was to see if she could persuade the greatest French composer of the day, Claude Debussy, to write a saxophone piece, or at least a piece that incorporated saxophone. So she wrote him a letter, and she explained that uh, what she was up to, and she offered him a lot of money. And he needed money at that point, apparently, and so he said, sure, I'd be happy to write you a, uh, a saxophone piece. Just send me the money. <laughs> <laughs> Which she did. She sent him the whole commission, and he uh, spent it and he proceeded not to write the piece. <laughs> this was in 1901. Two years later, she went to visit him. She took a boat across the Atlantic Ocean and she went to France and she went to Paris and she knocked on his door and she said something to the effect of, I'm a Lee's Hall, where's my piece? <laughs> and he said something to the effect of, Sacre Bleu, it is almost finished. <laughs> which of course it was not. And uh, he wrote to a friend of his not long after that and said, the Americans are proverbially tenacious. <laughs> the saxophone lady landed in Paris eight or 10 days ago and is inquiring about her piece. Of course, I assured her that with the exception of Ramesses II, it is the only subject that occupies my thoughts. All the same, I now have to start working on it. 
So here I am searching desperately for novel combinations to show off this aquatic instrument. So he was a little dismissive, uh, both of the saxophone and also of her. He referred to her to his wife. He called her that old bat um, <laughs> who dresses like an umbrella, uh, <laughs> which is not nice. In, in any event, he finally did write the piece. But it took him a long time. And it turns out to be a very beautiful piece. But as I was saying earlier, it's not a saxophone concerto per se, it's more analogous to his tone poem, The Afternoon of a Fawn, the prelude to The Afternoon of a Fawn, which is not a flute concerto, but it has enormous flute writing in it. And as a matter of fact, when I was listening to this piece last week, I began to realize as a flutist that it sounds in part a lot like Afternoon of a Fawn. There's a passage which sounds like this in the orchestral introduction which rang a bell and I began to realize, oh yes. So it wasn't my imagination, um, same key. It has, I think, the same kind of luminosity that we associate with Debussy and this uh, incredible uh, coloristic aspect to it. And it is a beautiful piece. Unfortunately, he didn't really finish it until towards the end of his life. It wasn't published until after he had died. It wasn't premiered until 1919, the year after he died. And by that time, poor Elise Hall had gone completely deaf. So she never got to hear this piece that was her most tenacious uh, desire. But we're fortunate because we do get to hear it played by Stephen and Zach now. So enjoy it. I'm sure you will. <laughs>